Voters. It is widely assumed that the Republicans will do well in the November elections because they are the out party in bad economic times and because they are more attuned to popular sentiments, exhausted and angry following two years of hyperspending left wing government from Washington. But it was not so long ago that the electorate was as fed up with the Republicans as it is today with the Democrats. What the Republicans might make of a renewed majority is the question on everyone's mind, especially that of Minority Leader Boehner, who could be in for a promotion. John Boehner ha hails from a large working class family near Cincinnati. He was his family's first college, gra college graduate, paying his own way through, and a successful businessman before enter entering local politics. First elected to represent Ohio's 8th Congressional District in 1990, he has been among his party's legislative leaders since 1994, chairing several important committees and being elected majority leader in 2006 and minority leader in 2008. Following his remarks, we will have a little bit of time for questions and discussion. Please join me in a warm welcome for House Minority Leader John Boehner. Uh, well, Chris, thank you for uh, that, that very nice introduction. Let me welcome uh, all of you, and I see that you all are survived uh, the storm that's out there uh, today. I'm going to begin uh, today by telling you a story. Uh, some years uh, ago, back in uh, Ohio, I was working my way through uh, Xavier University, and uh, while at uh, Xavier in night school, I uh, uh, entered a small business with an older gentleman. Uh, sadly, uh, some six or nine months uh, later, uh, my partner passed away. And uh, we had one customer left. Uh, so there, there I was. I've got a couple of years more school uh, at Xavier before I graduate, uh, trying to hold this business together. And uh, the little bit there was of it. And I want to tell you, uh, I fought for it with everything I had. Looking back on it uh, now, what strikes me is that I never thought about walking away. Uh, this was something that I invested my name in, my money in, and my reputation. And I had an obligation to that one paying customer, uh, as well as to my partner, uh, who was gracious enough uh, to bring me in, and uh, a guy who had put his time and energy in his business for a long time. Uh, today, I feel the same sense of obligation and determination when I look at what's happening to our government. Because, listen, uh, I've been here nearly 20 years. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And lately, uh, there's been a lot of ugly. Uh, Americans have every right to be fed up, and trust me, they are. But uh, what I won't accept, uh, and what I refuse to accept, is that we can simply walk away and let our government continue to drift uh, this government that our forebears sacrificed everything in order to build. The mission of the United States Congress is to serve the American people. And today, in part uh, due to institutional barriers that have been in place for decades, uh, that mission goes unfulfilled. Uh, these wounds have been self-inflicted by both parties. And if we don't fix them, it's possible that no one will be able to. In the Constitution, the House of Representatives is the first uh, institution of the first branch of government, the body closest to the people. Uh, it's an awesome responsibility, and we should take pride uh, in it, and we should be humbled by it. The House, more than any other part of our government, is the most direct voice of the people, and therefore should be avoided uh, or afforded the most care in protecting its ability to pr to protect the people's will. So today I'd like to talk to you about why this institution is broken and how we make it function again. Because until it does, ladies and gentlemen, we don't stand a, a chance of addressing our deepest and most pressing problems. 
And while I've got a lot uh, to say today, I really mean uh, to begin this as a conversation, a conversation with the American people and a conversation with my colleagues about how we fix the institution that we love. Just look at how the 111th Congress is so much, uh, not so much concluding as much as it has collapsed. Instead of tallying up a, a final flurry of legislative output, observers and constituents are asking what went wrong. Now, the answers could come easy to the people in this room, but the hard truth is that for families and small businesses is that their problems continue to go unaddressed. This week we had in my view, an obligation to bring both parties together and stop massive tax increases scheduled to take effect on January the 1st. Increases that we've seen coming now for two years. And even with the existence of a clear bipartisan majority and the support of the American people, we could not get a single up or down vote. It's a sad but not altogether surprising finale to this Congress and the latest in a long string of congressional sessions that have frayed the fragile bonds of trust between the American people and their elected representatives. The House, fi the House finds itself in a state of emergency. The institution does not function, does not deliberate, and seems incapable of acting on the will of the American people. And from the floor of the House to the committee level, uh, the integrity of the House has been compromised. The battle of ideas, the very lifeblood of the House, is virtually non-existent. Leaders overreach because the rules allow them to. Legislators adduct their responsibilities because the rules help them to. And when the rules don't suit the majority's purposes, they're just ignored. There's no accountability. There are no consequences. Uh, whether we here in Washington, believe it or not, uh, the American pe people clearly do. Now think about the, uh, our constant flouting of the rules uh, and compare it to a small business owner in America who has to spend his or her day complying with all of the mandates and regulations that the government from here in Washington sends down to them. This dysfunction in Congress is not new. Both parties share the blame for this. But the dysfunction has now reached a tipping point, at a point at which none of us can credibly deny that is having a negative effect on the people that we serve. And consider this. This is the first time uh, since the enactment of the budget re resolution in 1974 uh, that the House uh, has not passed a budget resolution. This is the first Congress in our history that has not allowed one bill to come to the floor under an open rule. The current freshman class uh, has served almost their entire term without ever having the chance uh, to bait a bill under an open process in the House. And the issue of martial law, uh, which gives the majority the power to bring up any bill at any time and strips the minority of the few rights that we have, has nearly doubled. The three pillars of any democracy are the rule of law, transparency, and a functioning civil society. Over the decades, all three of the pillars uh, have been chipped away in the people's house. Uh, the, working, uh, the work of making our institution function uh, cannot be reduced to one reform or one simple toolkit of reforms. The first, uh, let's talk about the rule of law. Uh, we always hear members of Congress talking about swearing an oath to represent their constituents when in reality the oath that we take is to the Constitution of the United States. We pledge to support and defend the Constitution of the United States no more, no less. But we have strayed far afield from our job description. Members go out and promise their constituents the moon and come to Washington and try to fulfill those commitments. And they, as a result, agree to conform to a system that emphasizes seniority and party loyalty. The ropes uh, are shown, uh, lead them to passing more bills, micromanaging more bureaucracies, and raiding the federal treasury. This is why in the Pledge to America, the governing agenda that my colleagues and I issued last week, we state that every bill that comes to the floor of the House uh, should contain a clear citation 
of the constitutional authority that allows Congress to do what they're asking it to do. And if we cannot do this much, uh, we ought to put the pen down and just stop. Uh, Congress has been most maligned over the past generation for its fiscal recklessness, and rightly so. Uh, mindful of the dangers of taxation without representation, the, the framers handed the power uh, to tax and spend to the legislative branch exclusively. It's right there, Article 1, Section 9. But having the right to do something doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. Uh, current congressional rules are rigged to make it easy to increase spending and next to impossible to cut spending. Uh, much of the law that governs this process, the Budget Act of 1974, is tied to rules instead of statutes. And consequently, we waive the Budget Act's requirements to serve our own purposes. Can't write a budget? Well, you just waive the rules and move on. No harm, no foul. Uh, the pay-as-you-go rule uh, has been repeatedly ignored to justify billions of dollars in new spending uh, and tax and fee increases. So we ought to start at square one and give serious consideration to revisiting and perhaps rewriting the 1974 Budget Act. And while the culture of spend spending stems largely from a lack of political will on both parties to say no, it's also the cons consequences of, I believe, uh, to be a structural problem. As McKevin, Kevin McCarthy, uh, my colleague from California, often says, a structure dictates behavior. And by structure, the facil facilitates spending increases and discourages spending cuts. Uh, the inertia in Washington currently is to spend and spend.